talking to you, John, here. Um, I understand you have some experience with the, uh, the Mona Lisa. And thought, uh, tell, me, tell me just a quick summary of, of, of what the whole thing is. What, what happened? Just well, it, it happened entirely by accident, Tom. I was uh, in my laser laboratory many years ago, and the phone rang, and I answered 2471 as I was speaking. And then I heard a pause, uh, there was a, uh, and then a man's voice came out, not somebody's secretary, and the, and the exact phrase was, my name is Paul Getty, and I deal in petroleum, perhaps you've heard of me. So he invited me to the Getty Museum to do some work, and uh, that got me involved with some of the art people at UCLA, one of whom is Carl Pedretti, the great Leonardo scholar. And, uh, and what year was this? That was 1982. Okay. And uh, so Carl and I worked together on some of the Getty Rembrandt paintings, uh, analyzing them for pentimenti and clarifying x-rays. And one day, uh, Carl said to me, you know, I just returned from, uh, from Windsor working on the Queen's collection of uh, Leonardo drawings. And he said, Lord Kenneth Clark was working with me. And Lord Clark learned a little bit about what I'd been doing with the computer imaging of the Rembrandts and said, why don't you have John try to clarify the Mona Lisa so before I die I can see what's under all that varnish and cracks. Okay, let's back up a little bit. You, computer analysis, uh, you're a physicist by training, right? That's correct, yeah. And you got into lasers and optics and folk photometry? Uh, well, the laser was invented while I was in graduate school. Okay. And I may have seen, I think I did see the first laser because one of my professors was Richard Feynman, the okay. Nobel laureate sure. theoretical physicist. And he gave a weekly lecture and I went to it and he'd just returned from his day of consulting at Malibu and he brought with him Ted Maiman's Ruby laser, the first laser of all wow. time. So that has a, had a major impact on me. So you use this laser technology to analyze art work? Well, we've done, through, since uh, the last, through the last 40 years, we've used lasers in countless different ways to yeah. restore art and analyze art. And at some point, uh, small computer technology came along and we started merging laser technologies, holographic technologies with digital imaging technologies. Yeah. And uh, it, through a number of years, the digital imaging technology overwhelmed any of the work we were doing with lasers. Mm -hmm. And that was the period where I met Carlo. Okay. So, so your analysis, that back to the original call from J. Paul Getty, uh, was uh, involving using your physics knowledge to investigate uh, existing paintings. Is that right, as opposed okay. to the rest of it. So bringing this back to art canvases now. <laughs> so you have the your, uh, holographic a transform of the, the brush strokes and the, the shadows that you see on the canvas by illuminating mm -hmm. them from a specific angle, right? Well, okay. yeah, the, the, uh, I, I suppose the thing that the connoisseurs of art have become very interested in are a couple issues. One is, uh, what's the general vector of the brush strokes? And then you can decide whether the and artist the was left, the, left the, the direction, not only the, the size of the, of the hairs on the brush. We're, we're really not talking about one inch brushes or quarter inch brushes. We're talking about the cameled hair uh, filaments, fibers, hairs in okay. the brush. And one of the issues is uh, naturally Leonardo was known to be left-handed and there are, I don't think I'm exaggerating, literally thousands of copies of the Mona Lisa, thousands of Mona Lisa images and everyone who owns one of those uh, purports that it's an original by Leonardo and, right. and wor is worth a billion dollars sure. rather than a hundred dollars. And so one of the er first tests you do on one of these uh, uh, Leonardo wannabes right. is to determine uh, the slope of the brush strokes to see if it was done by a left-handed artist or a right-handed artist. So that's essentially where you often begin yeah. when you're trying to determine whether a painting is by Leonardo or not, you start out with whether it was by a right-handed artist or a left-handed artist. So you can see that by just looking at the brush strokes yeah. and you, you photograph the image at a very high resolution or 
macro or lots of uh, smaller ones? Well, uh, the, I'll, I'll tell you the story as to how it actually happened. Um, Carlo Pedretti, the UCLA uh, connoisseur of Leonardo Artworks, suggested that Lord Kenneth Clark would like to see the Mona Lisa without the varnish and without the web of cleavages that obscure the painting itself. And so uh, Carlo asked me, uh, what do you need to do image enhancement of the Mona Lisa, digital enhancement, to try to remove the varnish and the, and the cleavage cracks and the uh, varnish and paint layers? I said, well, I've got to start with a good, good photograph of the Mona Lisa. I have some postcards, but those aren't going to work. And so he said, well, Lord Clark and I both have friends at the Louvre. We'll call somebody at the Louvre and have them send you a good archival photograph. Well, long story short, three years later, we still didn't have an archival large format photograph of the Mona Lisa. And it was about that time that Walter Cronkite came to my institution. To, he had retired from CBS News, and he'd had a summer program called Walter Cronkite's Universe. So he wanted to, to do a segment on my laser work on, on cleaning marble statues. And so uh, <clears throat> at the end of that week of videotaping, the producer and I were having lunch, and she said uh, she was disappointed. And I asked her, why were you disappointed? She th said, we thought you were going to tell us something about the Mona Lisa. And I said, well, a lot of people know I want to do the Mona Lisa, and I'm planning to do the Mona Lisa, but I'm waiting three years, and I still don't have a Mona Lisa image to digitize. And her exact response was, is that all? And she said, we'll have Walter call the Louvre. And that was on a Sunday, and on Friday, the Mona Lisa photographs started arriving in my mailbox. <clears throat> and we got started on the work with uh, CBS support, and then they got cold feet, and they thought it may not be what they hoped for, so they then contacted the Louvre, and they rented the Mona Lisa for a day. And so then we went to the, Mo to the Louvre Art Conservation Center in the basement, and we took our own photographs of the Mona Lisa. So was it just a, uh, oblique lighting? Is that <clears throat> well, the lighting is light? a real serious problem. Uh, we, we had a professional photographer who was doing it. We are doing some of our own photography. But almost any lighting that you tried, most of what you saw were the glints coming off the tinted, cracky lure peaks. And, uh, the, and so I, I think maybe hundreds of lighting arrangements were tried until we got a fairly decent image of our own. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's what we then sent to uh, NASA JPL to have them digitize it between Voyager flights, which they were mm -hmm. busy digitizing on their scanning microdigitometer. Okay, so now you've got the scan, and uh, what did you discover with it? Well, uh, we were we fought, well first we we also got a piece of varnish from the Mona Lisa, oh, okay. and we took that to the chemistry lab and we took a spectrum of the varnish, so we knew how much we should uh, push the blue and how much we should push the green and how much we should retard the red. And they call that a gain bias adjustment, and so we took the digital image and we did a gain bias adjustment, and the Mona Lisa that we got on the monitor screen looked pretty good except the, uh, <clears throat> the gain bias correction doesn't account for the fact that you have all these cracks on the surface. And so all the cracks got transformed with, as if they were the, the painting underneath the varnish. Instead, they're cracks on the surface of the varnish. So we had a pretty good looking Mona Lisa with a, a blue sky rather than a smoggy brown sky. And we got a pretty good Mona Lisa face who was, had kind of alabaster white skin rather than the sun tan of a California surfer. That was all fine, but all these cracks were amplified and we had all sorts of blue streaks and blue dots and everything from the crack allure. And I work, and, and I, I'm no expert, and I, I don't think I've ever done any serious programming, but I fussed around with the programs that were available on the system we were using and I couldn't get rid of the cracks. The, the first thing I thought, well, you'll just average them out. You just smear them out. Well, then the resolution went away. And I tried many things. And then somebody who watched me agonizing over this at UCSD said, well, there's some experts around here. And so I got some of the people who were doing 
uh, geological uh, imaging of the, the earth for petroleum exploration. And they fussed around a little bit and they improved the image a little bit and they said, but there's an expert up at uh, IBM Palo Alto, a fellow named Ralph Bernstein. Why don't you, and it was Buzz Bernstein locally who said, well, Ralph Bernstein is the person you want to get working on this. So I went up to, and about that time, uh, an interesting thing happened. A, a friend of mine at UCSD, his name is Ken Watson, uh, asked me a little bit about what I was doing. And I told him, and he said, well, this would be a natural for IBM funding. They would love doing something like this, helping with the Mona Lisa. I said, okay, fine. And, and, then, and then I think I heard from Ken a little while later, and he said, well, I'm going sailing in Long Island Sound, and with me will be uh, a vice president of IBM. I'll mention your project to him. And I, I thought nothing of it. And then a couple months later, I received a call from the chancellor's office. And they said, we have a, an envelope here from IBM headquarters, <clears throat> and in it is a check for $25,000. And there's a note that this should be used to, uh, to assist John Asmus in his work on the Mona Lisa. <laughs> and so what should we do with the check? I said, put it in the account. So, so I had an IBM connection at that point, and then writing on that IBM connection, <clears throat> I contacted Ralph Bernstein at IBM Palo Alto, took the tape up there, and they put it on the <clears throat> IBM supercomputer. And then he turned the project over to one of his assistants uh, or collaborators, uh, Joe Myers. And so Joe Myers and I worked on trying to get rid of the blue speckle from the image for a few days, and we're making some progress. <clears throat> and so we got a, a wonderful Mona Lisa then, <clears throat> and uh, we started showing it off to everybody. And everybody who came to look at our Mona Lisa said, oh, she's wearing a necklace. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we, uh, uh, everybody agreed, and, we, and I told him there was, I'd heard there was such a thing as pentimenti, and that as a painting gets restored, where, where it gets cleaned repeat, repeatedly, uh, the paint layer gets thinner, and you can start seeing hints of something underneath. And with the digital enhancement yeah. and the removal of the obscuration effects of the varnish, you could then see the hint of this necklace. And uh, <clears throat> I, I think that then led to a lot of controversy and debate. Now, the necklace, was that actually visible as, as a color showing through there? Or was it brush strokes? What, what did you actually see? To well, see? Uh, there, there's been a lot of work on that subsequently, and the consensus seems to be that Leonardo painted a necklace on, on an early composition, which he later modified, and that that necklace was essentially black, uh, carbon black pigment. Maybe the sitter, the lady, uh, Lisa Giardini, was wearing a black necklace when he painted her. Yeah. Uh, but there, there's an interesting story, which, I'll, uh, which I, I can't refrain from telling, and that is, in subsequent years, I worked on many, many of these Mona Lisa wannabes. And some of them that looked quite plausibly ha having been done by Leonardo. And at, at one point, I decided that one of the Mona Lisas, namely the, uh, the Mona Lisa in the Louvre, had the best background. And then I decided that what we now, what is now generally acknowledged is probably Leonardo's first attempt at a Mona Lisa called the Isleworth Mona Lisa. Uh, the background was never done by Leonardo and they had a lesser artist yeah. under contract to put in a background. But, but the lady that Leonardo painted that first time I, I think is substantially more beautiful than the one that's in the, uh, the lady that's in the Louvre. So I made a composite. I put the Louvre background with the Isleworth lady. And I think it's a beautiful painting, and I thought, but Leonardo started that painting with a lady with a necklace. So I went to Leonardo's artworks, I found a necklace, I lifted it off that painting, mm -hmm. and I put it on my composite painting, and I didn't like it one bit. And so I did exactly what Leonardo did, I got rid of the necklace. Uh, <laughs> okay. A little bit faster to do it in Photoshop. <laughs> oh, than sure, than sure, the, sure. The, uh, so, um, so what does this mean to the the art world? People that don't know technology or are interested in technology, they just want to 
see the art? What 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 did this open up to? Well, them? that's uh, that's uh, uh, in my estimation is an extremely broad and detailed subject. But I'll, uh, I think I can illustrate with an a anecdote. Part of the older generation. Well, well no, uh, I, I was part of a, a, a team uh, that was uh, Henry Gardner at the uh, San Diego Fine Arts Gallery, and. Uh, and people from the Putnam Foundation who have the Timken Gallery here in San Diego, we decided that San Diego could benefit by having an art conservation center. And so uh, we, we, we got together and we founded the Balboa Art Conservation Center, which exists to this day. And uh, once we'd founded the center, we found we had to find a director for the center. And we, uh, we ended up hiring a man from Oberlin College, who had the Oberlin College uh, Art Department and Conservation Center, and his name was Richard Buck. He was a, a student of George Stout, and at that time George Stout was probably 90, and Dick Buck was probably 70, yeah. and so we, I, we offered the job to Richard Buck at age 70, the, the second most notable person in U.S. art conservation, and he was delighted with uh, the prospects for bringing new modern technologies into art conservation. Yeah. So John, uh, you discovered some other um versions of, or other people discovered you that had other, other versions of the Mona Lisa. You want to tell me a little bit about that? Well, after our early publications, our first publication was in fact in uh, Perspectives in Computing by IBM. Yeah. The IBM people who'd played such an important role in all of this, they wanted control of the printing so they get the colors right. And I appreciate that. And so our first publication was in the IBM uh, Perspectives in Computing journal. And there was very little reaction to that. I think that mainly went to the computing world. Yeah. But then there were some reprints of that in some art journals and some newspapers and some magazines and some art conservation journals. And then I received a flood. It seemed like there must have been a thousand people in the world who had the original Mona Lisa in their, in their possession. <laughs> and... Uh, my friend, whom uh, I'll be happy to tell you about a little later, uh, Vittorio Besso, a, a connoisseur of art and an Italian, he, I, I asked him once about this, and he said, oh, well, the reason the Mona Lisa is so important and everybody wants to claim they have the Mona Lisa is it's a conspiracy theory. Uh, I, I believe the year was 1904, and the Mona Lisa painting <coughs> in the Louvre was stolen and disappeared. And two years later, it was recovered in Italy, and it was returned to the Louvre. Now, everyone who, who uh, looks toward conspiracy theories to explain everything uh, hypothesized that the painting that went back to the Louvre was a copy that the Italians had made, and that the actual Mona Lisa was hidden somewhere. And these dozens if not hundreds of letters and phone calls and telegrams that I received were from people that ha had some either plausible or implausible story as to why the Mona Lisa they had was the actual one that had been stolen from the, from the Louvre Museum. Okay, um, so continue. So one of the, uh, so many of these uh, purported Mona Lisas w could be dismissed quite easily, quite readily, any, any number of things. Uh, an, an expensive thing you can do is to do radiocarbon dating of the panel or, or some of the materials of the painting, and you find that it's, it's not old enough to be a, a Leonardo da Vinci painting. There are other things, uh, some of them were just such obvious frauds to even a, a scientist with no art training as I, but others, uh, you, you show that, I would show some of these photographs that would be sent to me to Carlo Pedretti or at one point Lord Kenneth Clark or some of the others, and they say, oh no, that can't be Leonardo, look at this, look at the finger, and, yeah. and, but there were some that were uh, possible Leonardo's, 
And I had been working for the Rembrandt Research Institute that had been working with uh, J. Paul Getty on the Getty Museum Rembrandt collection. And I developed something that I thought made connoisseurship a little more solid and scientific. Now, there's something you can do with the statistics of uh, pixels in paintings, and that is you can look at the pixel distributions. And uh, for example, if you look at an Andy Warhol painting, you find there are bright pixels and dim pixels and blue pixels and yellow pixels and nothing in between. And if you, uh, if you take the statistics of those pixels, you find sharp peaks at different places. If you take a Leonardo, who is famous for what's called sfumato or chiaroscuro, where things are very, very ca carefully blended and you have subtle changes from one color to another, you, you get a pi pixel intensity distribution that's very smooth and gradual with, uh, with, with peaks in certain places that have to do with skin tones or something. And we found that very successful with the Rembrandt paintings. The Rembrandt Research Institute, which was very scientific and very methodical in their approach, was aware that there were a couple of hundred paintings hanging in museums around the world that all purported to be Rembrandt self-portraits. And so the Rembrandt Research Institute in Amsterdam uh, obtained permission, sometimes very laboriously, from these museums to do very careful measurements. In some cases it involved um, uh, uh, radiocarbon dating, in some cases it involved analysis of the pigments to see whether it was, they were the same pigments that yeah. Leonardo used, and so forth. And I had joined in on that using this thing that's called the histogram of the, uh, of the intensities of the red, green, and blue bands. And, sh and we found that Rembrandt paintings, by Rembrandt, there were characteristic distributions of intensities. And so we used the Rembrandt Research Institute's uh, opportunity, the, their opportunity in studying these Rembrandts to essentially validate and perfect this histogram technique for looking mm -hmm. at paintings. And, and uh, it's a little bit like some of the uh, laser techniques in medicine, where you have conventional surgery going on and conventional pathology going on, and then you have somebody shining a laser at, at the patient, and you see if the laser gives the same result as conventional medicine. Well, in, in we, we use this same approach in art conservation. And so we, in the Rembrandt issue, instance, we were using the work that was ongoing to validate and perfect our histogram technique. So I began using that technique to look at the purported Leonardo Mona Lisa's, which was something that didn't involve any inter intervention. You didn't have to take pigment samples. You didn't have to take wooden samples and send them to some place where they could do radiocarbon dating. You took the photograph, you looked at the intensity, you say that's, that's way off from what the known Leonardo uh, pixel distributions are. Mm -hmm. And so we, so that gave me a, another way of sorting through all of these images that, that were, were sent to me. But there was one story that came through. Uh, for about a year I heard from a series of attorneys from Zurich, Geneva, New York, and Palo Alto and these were all lawyers with a, a firm that was handling the estate of the Pulitzer estate. And uh, after some, some strange communications with them, they finally admitted to me that the reason that they wanted to talk to me was that in Pulitzer's collection of fine art was a Mona Lisa. And they were trying to, to divide up the estate amongst the Pulitzer heirs and they didn't know what to do with this painting. They didn't know whether it was worth a lot or nothing or, or a fair amount. And so I, after much negotiation, it was decided that when I, on my next return from Italy, which involved a train ride from Milan to, uh, to Geneva, that I'd get off the train in Lausanne. So I got off the train in Lausanne, and there was a black limousine waiting for me. And I got in the black limousine, and we drove to a Swiss bank, the kinds of banks that have numbered accounts. 
And then we drove into an underground parking garage. <clears throat> and in this empty parking garage, there was another black limousine. And I started feeling this is a little like the Bourne Identity or something like that. I was looking around to mm -hmm. see whether there was somebody with a machine gun or something. Right. And we pulled up next to the other limousine, and, and, the, and, and a lawyer got out. His name was Fred D-Day. And he popped the trunk, and he looked in, and there was a Mona Lisa. And he, said, and he asked me, do you think that Mona Lisa was painted by Leonardo? Mm -hmm. I said, How can I tell? And I said, uh, should I take some samples and do radiocarbon dating? Should I take some pigment samples? No, no, you can't touch it. So I, I got out my camera and I took a couple pictures of it. And I said, okay, I'll, uh, I'll look at these, study these pictures and see if there's anything I can do. So I did the Rembrandt analysis, type of analysis that we had done on the Rembrandt self-portraits of that painting and compared them with the histograms we had for the Louvre piece. And I was astounded. The histograms matched perfectly, mm -hmm. which I had never seen before with any of the other Mona Lisas. And so I conveyed that to the, uh, to the uh, Pulitzer state attorneys. And then they said, uh, they'd like me to do something else. Is there anything else you can do with your photographs? I said, well, art historians, uh, they look at the geometrical construction. And with Leonardo, that's a big deal. They talk about how there are these uh, arrangements of figures in The Last Supper by Leonardo. They're in triangular form. And, they're, and they, they say the, the, and then there's the golden ratio. And if you look at any of Leonardo's artworks, and some other artists as well, you find that the ratio between a face and a body or something of that sort is the golden, is the golden ratio. I don't know, it's 1.6 something or another. And so I, I said, well, I can do something on proportions and geometry. And so I did that with my photographs and sent them. And I said, that looks pretty good too. And that was 1990. And for the next 20 years, they'd be in contact with me every few months. And my role at that point was just to give them leads to other art conservatives. And they had a little bit more confidence that this was, uh, that, the, that there really was a chance that this Isleworth painting was by Leonardo. And so little by little, they gained confidence that maybe you can do some more serious analyses. And so ultimately I put them in touch with some people who could do radiocarbon dating, and they did radiocarbon dating. I put them in touch with some people in Germany who were very good at analyzing pigments. And, they, and so they took pigment samples and they analyzed those and compared them with what Leonardo customarily used, and that looked good. And then by this time, <clears throat> I developed a relationship with some of the people doing things in Paris with lasers and spectroscopy and imaging that I've been doing, and arrangements were made to send the Isleworth Mona Lisa to that laboratory and to borrow the Leonardo Mona Lisa from the Louvre and put them side by side in that laboratory. And they did three-dimensional imaging and they looked at spectral distributions, some of the things I did but with much greater accuracy and care. And they came up with a positive uh, result that these, these matched. And, several, and so over the next 20 years, that kind of thing happened repetitively. And f finally, uh, they, the art historians that had been engaged by what was now the Mona Lisa Foundation, which uh, the, that painting was then transferred from the Pulitzer Foundation to the Mona Lisa Foundation of Zurich, Switzerland. And uh, once it was in that foundation, they, and they had exhausted all the uh, opportunities for dating it and determining the provenance, they decided that uh, they somehow had to explain the things that had been coming out of this. And, and I think the bottom line is a rather simple and elegant solution. And as physicists, we like simple, elegant solutions. And there are, there's a great deal of evidence to suggest that Leonardo painted the Mona Lisa in 1503. And there's a great deal of credible evidence that he painted the Mona Lisa in 1513. How could it be both? Well, the elegant, simple solution is that he painted two Mona Lisas just as he painted two Virgins of the Rocks, 
to Madonna with the child, to Madonna with St. Anne and so forth, that uh, why not paint mm -hmm. two Mona Lisas? Why not paint one in 1503 and one in 1513? And so a, a, a theory was developed about that. And incidentally, it was ironic. It, it destroyed one of my theories. When I found the necklace and I found some other pentimenti in the Louvre Mona Lisa, I developed a theory, and the theory had to do with another point of controversy, and that is, who is the lady in the Mona Lisa? There's a, a lot of ambiguity and controversy about that. And so I developed a theory, not originally, with, not original for me, but it was in support of, a, of an obscure theory that the lady who was painted in the Mona Lisa portrait was Costanza de Avlos, the, the princess of, uh, of Fracovia. And there, there's a long story as to why I thought that and so forth. But uh, once you established that there was a Mona Lisa in 1503, Leonardo was there in Florence, and so evidently the information that this was uh, Lisa Guardi Guardini, uh, that becomes pretty obvious. And, and if it's 1513, then it's way too late for it to be Costanza de Avalos. And so I helped destroy my own theory. Yeah. And, uh, but they were the same woman. And, and here's the, the way things stand in interpretation at this point, that Leonardo was engaged in the, in the f form of the main theory about the Mona Lisa. He was engaged by members of the Medici court to paint this lady, L Lisa. And her husband, his name was Giocondo. So you can see how it might be Mona Lisa del Giocondo. And, uh, evid and that was about the time Leonardo was, was having some trouble collecting fees for artworks and things like that. So his life was a bit of a jumble at that time. And he did something that was characteristic of, of Leonardo. It would seem that he got started on the Mona Lisa portrait. Evidently, he painted the lady and her portrait, but he didn't paint the surround. He didn't paint a background. And we believe that that painting was the Isleworth painting, and that then the owners of the painting, probably somebody in the Medici court, hired some naturally lesser artist to fill in a background, which is what turned many of the art historians off to the Isleworth piece, because the, the background is so uh, amateurish. So the, the theory goes that then Leonardo was called to Rome, and then he went back to Milan, and he ended up in France. And 10 years later, decided he was going to do the Mona Lisa second version. And by that time, he was out of touch with the Florentines. So we feel, in his mind's eye, he tried to imagine what that lady in 1503 would look like in 1513. So he apparently aged her in his genius mind. And uh, so the last step in our attempt to validate the Isleworth Mona Lisa's being by Leonardo is that some people with the FBI were engaged to do age regression. And so they got the photograph, actually my photographs, of the image enhanced Louvre lady, yeah. and then they took 10 years off her age, which they do for children on milk, milk, milk cartons and so forth. And then they used their software to to uh, assess whether 